So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Felix. Uh, I'm a freelance pen tester. I've been doing this for a, a while now and breaking into stuff, you know, longer. But uh, yeah, um, today I'm here to talk to you about uh, some work that I did for my master's uh, dissertation. Uh, and essentially, I was told go away, find a find a project, go do some uh, sort of mild research. And uh, at the same time, I had a client that basically refused to take my word for it. Um, they, they told me that uh, they had lots of people who lived in cafes and airports and hotels and stuff using free Wi-Fi uh, uh, and open Wi-Fi, uh, and they did nothing about it. They, they essentially had all of their traffic just going across the internet, and, and it worried me. Uh, and, and so the, the guy turned around to me when I was telling him this and said, well, can you, can you prove it? Can you show me this? And, uh, because otherwise I'm going to do nothing about it. Um, I had a look around and I genuinely, I couldn't find a tool that really did anything that the business cared about. Uh, so I started out by uh, doing it myself. Um, the uh, work I'm about to show you relies quite heavily on man in the middle. So just as a recap for everyone who uh, may or may not know it, uh, man in the middle conditions are essentially where you have um, a bit of infrastructure where an attacker controls it and can uh, do stuff with the communication that's going back and forth between uh, a legitimate user and uh, a, a service. So things you can do, listen to communication, change the communication or block the communication. Um, and so um, I decided I was going to uh, basically make my own little Wi-Fi access point. Um, yeah, uh, I'd steal some uh, users' creds by being a, a man in the middle, uh, and then turn around to my client and say, well, you know, this is why you need to do something about it. Um, at this point in time, I thought, yeah, this is going to be easy. Um, you know, why would it be hard? Uh, it's open Wi-Fi, right? Anyway, it turns out encryption is a thing. Obviously, I already knew this, but um, it can be done at lots of different places. And these days, there's not that much in terms of uh, plaintiff's creds going around the world. It's uh, usually encoded in something, encrypted somewhere. Uh, and so that uh, sort of proved very quickly to me that I needed to do something a bit different. Um, so the idea was to go from this, uh, you know, a normal transaction, to something a little bit more like this. And I already had a bit of a plan uh, based on some of the work that I, I've seen and I know is quite prevalent out there in the world. Uh, and essentially, I, I do stuff down at the bottom. But this, this pink bit here is where the, uh, me, as the attacker, can, can do stuff um, as the man in the middle. Um, so what I actually did, I, I took a Wi-Fi pineapple um, and I set up a, a wireless network and I thought I was pretty obvious with uh, the name that I used, you know, don't touch it, but people did anyway, uh, why not? Um, and so uh, this is what it actually looked like. I had a 4G modem, my little Wi-Fi pineapple battery. I wanted to prove to my client that it was portable, you could do it anywhere and it was nice and easy. Um, uh, anyway, so I, um, I just started writing my tool. So I had an idea of what I wanted to do with it all. Uh, and, and so I, um, I took somebody else's code, uh, frankly, because it was easy, it worked. Uh, and then I added stuff to it. Um, uh, and and I, I went through this process uh, over quite a long time of you know, building a bit, and it worked a bit. And then I would come up with a bug later, and then I ended up tearing my hair out and leaving it and coming back to it later. And you know, a good software development life cycle, obviously. But um, this is what it fundamentally does. Um, it uh, is a transparent proxy sat on top of the SMB capture stack from Responder. Uh, and what it does, uh, the bit that's important, is it injects an image uh, tag in there in, in HTML. Because um, I knew I couldn't get plain text creds, so what I was going to do instead is the next best thing and get a net NTLM hashes uh, so that I can do cracking against those. Um, I called it ETAC, um, so evil twin authentication capture, because you know I'm clever <laughs> like that. Um, so Windows Auth, um, one of the things that uh, you can do with Windows Auth um, is basically uh, use things like Internet Explorer to, to do uh, authentication attempts against resources that you've got in your control. Uh, I was convinced that it was really important for me to make sure that this was done against uh, as stock uh, Windows as possible, uh, because uh, I've seen lots of presentations of similar nature that uh, you, you kind of tweak things and move stuff around and make it really weak, and then it works. But I wanted this to be sort of more real than that. Um, so uh, I didn't even install anything, so no Firefox or anything along those lines. The only change I made to my victim machines, um, which you'll see in a bit, is I added them to an Active Directory uh, domain. Um, Sort of. So um, 
to uh, clarify, um, what I'm trying to do is get Internet Explorer to authenticate against something. Um, and the way that by stock it can do that is if uh, on the left-hand side there you can see it says automatic logon only on Internet Zone. So if it thinks that it's part of the Internet, it will do it. Um, and the Internet is defined by this one on the right-hand side, which is essentially um, all sites that are explicitly listed as your Internet, uh, in your Internet Zone, um, all sites that bypass the proxy server, and anything that uh, is a UNC path, or better known as the dot rule, uh, which uh, essentially means you can only do this against host names. You can't do it against IP addresses or fully qualified domain names because, well, they have a dot in them, they're obviously not part of your internet, and so on. Um, so I realized very quickly I needed a DNS server that was under my control as well. Oh, sorry, go back one. Um, uh, this is what my attack <laughs> structure ended up being. Uh, so first of all, you, on the left, you've got the, the victim, joins the uh, Evil Twin wireless network, asks for a DHCP um, uh, release, and it gets one from the attacker's, uh, attacker's server. Uh, and then this bit here, we've got uh, two transactions, really. Uh, one, uh, both of them go through uh, the, the web proxy, but one's the request and one's the response. Now, um, on the way out, I... Um, I do my best to not exactly downgrade stuff, but kind of weaken the request a little bit. So deal with certain um, uh, headers that are in the HTTP transaction, a few other bits and pieces. Not so much like SSL stripping. I wasn't interested in that. I was trying to just make it uh, easy, frankly, for me on the, the return path. Um, on the return path, I then do uh, lots of things, but one of them is inject that image tag that I showed you earlier. Uh, and then obviously, uh, the next bit is uh, the... A uh, victim machine needs to know where to send the uh, next request, so it has to do a DNS lookup, so it gets that. And then here in, uh, is where the SMB uh, stack stuff from Responder kicks in. Uh, so it asks for a resource, it's told, no, you need to authenticate first, and then it authenticates and asks for the resource and, and maybe get something back. Um, so that sounds like it should be brilliant, right? But, um, it kind of works, um, and I'll explain why. Um, first of all, um, HTTP is a, is a pain. Um, frankly, there's quite a lot of variance in there. Um, so uh, the Wi-Fi pineapple doesn't have a lot of power to it. So one of the things I had to do was not go into uh, just using other people's libraries and, and click, 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 done. I had to write most of this myself. Um, uh, and then there were status codes that kept coming up with problems I had no idea. I've never seen before, like 416, which is uh, range not uh, satisfiable. And I'm like, what on earth does that mean? And then working through the different types of uh, headers that I spotted, which were causing me problems. Um, and, uh, and then normal error handling, because you know, sometimes people don't finish a connection. It just it dies for whatever reason. They, they escape it. Um, and then, obviously, there's differences between transparent proxies and declared proxies. Uh, sometimes uh, one of the things that uh, I hadn't realized beforehand was that transparent proxies don't get explicitly told what port to actually go and make the request on because it's part of the original transaction. So if you're doing IP tables manipulations, you lose some of that information. It's, uh, uh, it's easy to kind of get it, but you have to code it all in. Um, and then my favorite bit was the chunking. Um, uh, so HTTP 1.0 uh, and 1.1 work in a little bit of a, a different way. And although they are a bit interchangeable, uh, one of the, the most difficult parts of this was dealing with chunk transfer encoding, CTE, um, because uh, essentially, if you think about it, you, you get a chunk of information and then the next chunk and the next chunk and the next chunk. And, uh, and that's fine, but the, you have to work out what the schema is. And there seems to be two main types. Um, there's one which are marked, um, which is on the left-hand side at the bottom here, and it says how big the next chunk is. And then there's ones that don't have any markers at all. Um, but either way, if you think about it, I'm trying to inject uh, an HTML tag, and you have to be quite careful where that goes. Otherwise, you end up with half of it in one chunk and half of it in the next chunk. Or you save it all up and you're a transparent product proxy, manipulate the whole thing, and then spit it out. But that then gives you a massive delay, which you know, might make users suspicious. Um, anyway, so the success I had was the fact that a standalone Windows 7 machine gave me net and CLM creds no problem whatsoever. Every single time, it was happy. The moment I joined it to an Active Directory domain, things started going a bit pear-shaped. Uh, what happens is um, you have the, the SMB connection up here, and Almost straight away, it tries to work out where the Kerberos uh, KDC is uh, at the FQDN of its domain that it knows about. And when it doesn't get a response back, no such name, you just, it just literally sends an RST. End of connection, game over. 
Um, there's lots of ways that I think I could maybe develop this further. Uh, bluntly putting it, I ran out of time for my master's <coughs> thesis, so I had to submit and it was fine. But uh, I think you might well be able to develop this further so that you could uh, impersonate the KDC perhaps. Depends on exactly what it's looking for to prove that it is within the network that it thinks it's in. Um, so. Uh, in summary, um, my tool is on GitHub. Um, uh, I definitely think I could develop it further, and I really would like to. Um, but you know, time needs to happen. If you guys want to do it, please do. Um, essentially, AD join network uh, machines, not going to happen at this point in time. But anything else, anything loose, you're onto a winner. Um, so uh, do I have uh, any questions? <laughs>